let's start okay thanks good afternoon everyone end inequalities end aids end pandemic this is the logo chosen for world aids day hearty welcome to all of you all all of you for learning in or knowing what's new in hiv with respect to counseling uh, from afpi karnataka chapter uh, at the outset i would like to welcome the one of the stalwarts in hiv counseling and care professor of family medicine dr g d ramendran so i also welcome dr ramakrishna prasad rk as we call him shortly needs no introduction from family physicians uh, perspective quite a well known uh, approachable family medicine specialist he is basically md family medicine and mph and he is an infectious disease specialist among us always available for help for challenging cases for family practice with respect to may it be hiv may it be hepatitis b c etc rk is just a phone call away so rk is also a chief clinical infectious disease specialist who is a founder member of pcmh restore health private limited and he chairs the academy of family physicians of india national center for primary care research and policy and of course he is vice president of karnataka chapter welcome dr ramakrishna prasad he is a simple person with over 29 national and international publications and uh, he is the moderator for today's session over to dr ramakrishna prasad thank you Uh, thank you dr somya for that embarrassingly generous introduction uh, it's uh, truly my our privilege to have professor gd ravindran uh, speak to us on the occasion of world aids day today um, dr gd ravindran has been a leader in this field for many decades now and uh, particularly i'm i'm so thrilled that he's speaking to us about what is important in hiv counseling because if there is one thing that transforms the natural course the outcomes of for a patient with hiv it is actually the doctor patient connect and the the counseling that takes place between a doctor and a patient additionally uh, professor ravindran and it's such a pleasure to call him professor of family medicine uh, with the new uh, department of family medicine at uh, st john's uh, medical college professor ravindran has also done uh, has a whole body of work in medical ethics so i cannot think of a better person to be uh, sharing insights and teaching us on what is new in hiv counseling uh, sir over to you thank you thank you dr ram krishna for the nice introduction before we begin what i would propose to do is i will talk about the basics of how the counseling has changed over a period of time and i also how the newer discoveries and newer treatments have changed how we counsel people okay it is not the same old thing that we used to do in the past that we keep repeating but with the change in therapy change in programs we need to modify our way of talking uh, <coughs> counseling patients so uh, that's why i'm going to put there i'll put questions in between and since this is a virtual meeting i'll pause for about a minute so that somebody from the audience can answer and if they don't answer at least type it on a chat box what answers that you would like to give for this questions okay now to begin with remember this hiv is a new disease and it's only 40 years ago 1980 Uh, one, uh, one that is a uh, eighty one in June. The clinical description of AIDS was described, and within one year, two years of description of AIDS disease, we knew what caused it. We knew how to prevent it, but we had to wait for seven long years before we had a treatment for this condition. And since then, 
the treatment has progressed so much that it has changed the way we look at it. And but even in that also, we have problems that we have. And today the World Aid Day, the UN Aid says that we should end the pandemic because we know there are interventions that can uh, control the, the person's HIV and make him non-infectious. We need to end AIDS because if you treat patients properly with antiretroviral therapy, they, they should not be lining up with AIDS. But much more important than that, what we have is inequalities in our society that helps to cure the HIV and AIDS pandemic. And that is what we are trying to look at in these patients. Now, it's a major global public health global problem and it claims about 36 million people and there are no cure for infection. HIV infected people are living longer and have healthier lifestyles. So we have a large pool of HIV infected patients who will come for care and we need to talk to them. And this is because of improved diagnosis and care, including for opportunistic infection and increasing access to effective and HIV prevention. At the end of 2020, we have about 37 million people who are living with HIV AIDS and deaths have increased to 680,000 births there and new infections. That is what causes us. It is still 1.5 million and we need to reduce this new infections to a letter test. This is a figure of what we see in India and you see progressively from 2004 onwards, the incidence of HIV in our country is decreasing. And when you look at Karnataka, we contribute about 11% of total HIV population in the country. So it is still a problem that we have to face in our country and in our state. So now it looks as if we are controlling the trajectory of infections. And if we have to do something, we have to break this trajectory and epidemics. We have only about five to six years of time. And if we don't do that, it will again spring back into <coughs> into prominence. And that is why the UNAIDS called for, in, they came with a slogan 1990-90 by 2020. It means 90% of people who are infected know that they are infected. Of those 90% who know they are infected, another 90% would take treatment. And if they take treatment, 90% of them will be suppressed of viral uh, virus in the body. So it, in fact, what this, though it looks very grand, 1990-90, remember only 70% of the people who are infected will have suppressed viral loads. And because of COVID, this changed. And so the UNAIDS changed it into 95, 95, 95 by 2030. So in the next 10 years, we have to achieve somewhere around 95, 95, 95 for that. And usually we have to reduce the new infections to 200,000. And you should have zero discrimination for patients. And that is what we talk about, us tracking and ending the epidemic by 2030. This is what UNAIDS hopes to achieve by the end of this year. Now, when we look at it, HIV AIDS has changed phases. In the past, it was an acute presentation, high mortality. In 1989, when we saw patients, most of the patients would not last even for a month. They would succumb. Males were more predominantly affected than women. Symptomatic treatment is all that we could offer. We would talk to the patients, give them IV fluids, give them nutrition, give them some antibiotics, and most of them would die. And we did not have a government program. And for us to prevent this was the only way that we could prevent the HIV infection from occurring was change in behavior. So the whole counseling was geared at prevention, changing the behavior. We talked about advertisements where we talked about condoms, condom used to prevent HIV infection. And today, you rarely see a condom advertisement for controlling HIV. HIV infection. Patients had short lifespan. There was a large number of children who had HIV and AIDS, and there was a lot of stigma about HIV and AIDS. Today, over the last uh, 40 years, it has changed from an acute presentation to chronic disease. Mortality has decreased. Males are equal to females. Effective treatment is there to control the infection. Effective government programs are there today. And we have drugs which are the mainstay of prevention of HIV infection. We need to talk, instead of talking about counseling for prevention, we talk about counseling for adherence. And these patients are expected to have normal lifespan because of good mother to child programs. Children are less affected. And today we have AIDS law, 
which is supposed to improve and prevent discrimination in the society. So we have come a long way in the last 40 years when we talk about HIV and AIDS. Now as primary practitioners, we can reduce HIV and AIDS. First and foremost, we must suspect, diagnose HIV positive patients, and we must help to initiate treatment. Counseling is an important thing, like uh, Dr. Ramakrishna said, it builds a doctor-patient relationship, and this counseling is what is, and since it's a lifelong disease, family practitioners are the ones who have to deal with patients, and you have to counsel them. Then we get emergencies, which had to be handled as family practitioners, and ultimately, when all the treatment fails, we have to so give them family support and also provide them palliative care. So we have a full continuum of care for which family practitioners are involved. Now, when you talk about testing strategies, it has evolved over a period of time. Consent is essential for testing. In the beginning, we had voluntary testing. That is, a patient found that uh, has been counseled and he thinks that he has got a risk for developing HIV infection, he has had multiple sex partners or he has been using IV drug abusers. He goes and voluntarily goes and tests for the infection. Then we have mandatory testing. This was done in blood banks because <coughs> they had to protect the recipient from receiving, uh, from receiving contaminated blood. Then we had this concept of provider-initiated Testing. Now, in provided initiated testing, what we used to do is a doctor suspects that this person has got tuberculosis, for example, and we know tuberculosis is associated with HIV. He advises the patient to undergo a tuberculosis, I mean, HIV test. So it was doctor initiated or provided initiated testing. And this made a lot of difference for diagnosis. Here also, there are two methods that we use. One is known as the opt in technique. Another is the opt-out technique. Opt-in technique is you tell the patient to give an example. We have to check your blood sugar. Um, do I have your permission to check your blood sugar? And if the patient says yes, we check the blood sugar. This is known as opt-in. Opt-out is I am doing a blood sugar. If you are against testing, please let me know. Then I will not do. This is known as opt-out technique. And this is the technique that we use when we are talking about provider initiated testing for testing for HIV infections. So most of our patients, I mean, we tell the patients that we are going to do a HIV test. And if you have any objections, we will not do the test. If you do not have the objections, we will do the test. And this also includes that we will counsel the patient saying that we are testing for HIV and HIV is a chronic disease that may affect you. So this is the and when people have applied opt-out uh, technique, that is, you are, of course, not doing the test if the patient objects to it, large number of HIV-positive patients are detected. In what some of the studies, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, they also have got around 60 to 70 percent who test for HIV infection. So, this is, so today, we would always have a provided initiated testing, and it will be an opt-out technique that we would follow. Now, when we talk about Techniques. I'd like you to look at the screen. You have the serology that goes on and uh, what happens in it. The virus enters the body and for about five days, there are no changes taking place in the body of the person. And this is called as the eclipse period. During this period, infection cannot be detected. So this is very important when the family practitioner patient says that I had an unprotected sex, I want to check whether I'm HIV infected. You have to tell him that immediately there are no tests. And by six to eight days, you do NAT test, nucleic acid amplification test. By 13 to 20 days, viral proteins are present, antibodies appear. And most patients present longer than after the initial infection when tests for antibodies and nucleic acids are both positive for the patient. We need to understand this because then only we can order this test properly when patients come to us. And today, the National AIDS Control Organization says only ELISA, HIV ELISA is used for diagnosis. Western blot is not recommended. NAT tests are not routinely used. And concern for testing is a legal requirement that we have. And there are four different generations of ELISA that we have, where we look at HIV antigen P24 and 
antibodies, IgG, IM, is what you see in four player elected. And we also have rapid tests, which are a whole lot of tests is there. But when you do a rapid test, which is available in India, remember they can detect 99.5% of all HIV infected patients and false positive results is less than 2%. So if you detect the rapid test, it's as good as doing that conventional ELISA because the NACO does not permit kits that do not come to this level of uh, accuracy. And usually we have three different strategies that we use. This is a little complicated side. In a blood bank, you need to have safe blood to be given to them or for organ transplantation, we need a safe organ to be donated. So even if there is little suspicion that it may be infected, we would reject it. So you do a single test for the patients. If the LISI is positive, then the blood sample is eliminated. And if it is negative, it is considered as negative and the blood is accepted. Now, when you talk about for surveillance or when you have a symptomatic patient, you do, do two different ELISAs on the same sample. If both are positive, then you call it as a positive sample. If you have an asymptomatic person, you do three ELISAs before you discover the <laughs> and declare a person as HIV positive. So we must understand this just because a patient comes with a HIV report which says positive, you should not accept it on face value. We need to cross check whether three tests are done, two tests are done, one test is done. If it is done from a government ERT center, three tests will be done. But many often in private practice, only one test may be done or not more than one test will be done. So you need to know your lab and what tests they do before you declare a person as HIV positive. Now, NAT tests are qualitative and quantitative. This is another word for viral diagnosis, uh, viral loads. It is used in early infant diagnosis. Window period also, it can be used, but at present, NAT4 does not recommend the use of NAT4 diagnosis of acute HIV infection because of high <coughs> levels of false positivity. Western blood test is also not recommended unless there is a controversy and only a few reference laboratories does national, national AIDS control organization allow Western blood tests to be done. Now we have a patient here, a 36 year old carpenter. He presented with 10 days of fever. On examination, patient had an oral chest and a heel scar of herpes zoster on left side, T8 to T10. Will you order a HIV screening test? Can somebody give an answer to this please? Yes, sir. Pardon? Yes, you'll, sir. Add a, you'll order a, a screening test for HIV screening test. Yes, sir. Why yes, do you, sir. what is the basis on which you'll order? Uh, sir, one is herpes zoster, uh, which has uh, healed and it is a recent one, plus yes. oral thrush. Oral thrush? And he has multiple layers yes. of. Uh, uh, <coughs> Infections that has taken in multiple dermatomes. So it is more in favor of a HIV and mm -hmm. herpes zoster. So when we talk about it, we have certain diseases which can be used, which can be clinical as well as behavioral. And usually you have acute autoimmune diseases like idiopathic thrombocytopenic herpes, GB syndrome, psoriasis, Graves disease, antiphospholipid syndrome, primary biliary cirrhosis, though it is rare. These are autoimmune diseases in which you may have to check the HIV status. Opportunistic infections that commonly we see where we think of HIV is thrush, herpes zoster, pneumonia in the air, tuberculosis, and unexplained fever, weight loss, or diarrhea more than two weeks. <clears throat> People receiving treatment for hepatitis, tuberculosis, or sexually transmitted disease because of more of an acquisition of HIV and these diseases are similar, have to be checked for HIV. Other important consideration that you have to take into account is behavioral. Sex partners of people who have HIV. Heterosexual who themselves may be negative or who sex partners have more than one sex partner. Example, homemakers. They will be at home, but the husbands may be having multiple partners, so there is a high chance of getting infected. 
travelers, migrants, sex workers, men having sex with men, intravenous drug users, all these people have a high incidence of HIV and they need to be tested for HIV. Now, J comes with a test report and it's HIV positive from lab. What will you do? Somebody else, please. First, check if it has been done the way twice or thrice. Okay, very good. Then? Then probably ask for his risk behavior. No. Okay, then? Uh, look for any other infections around. Okay, since he's just then? possibly symptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay, then? Yeah, then probably refer to HIV specialist. Refer to HIV sir. Okay. Now, when you talk about it, how if the thing that I said is, of course, we talked about confirming the diagnosis. We talked about the tests have to be done. Remember that. And the important thing that you have to do is to counsel. And this has been a change in the way we deal with it. Today, the date when if you diagnose a person as HIV positive, you start him on ART medication. So that is called as early initiation of ART. So it is a very short period of time where we start ART medication for these patients. In the last three, four years ago, we would counsel the patient, wait for the CD4 counts to come down and then start on ART medication. But now in 2021, we emphasize that we should start the ART treatment as soon as diagnosis is made, preferably within one week of diagnosis. It has its own problems, but you have to do that. And second thing that is very important is, when you ask about factors for risk behavior, in your first meeting, you will never get it out from the patient. The minute they know that they are HIV positive, they could go to a shell and they'll blame the doctor, they'll blame the injury that they received, everything under the sun. So, and Knowing how they got it is not going to make any difference to the way you are going to treat the patient. So I'm inquiring about how, <clears throat> what is the risk for, uh, how they got the risk factors is not going to help you in helping the patient. And that is why it does not make sense when you're meeting the patient for the first time and you're counseling to know what are the risk factors for HIV infection. And usually what we talk about is Implications of HIV diagnosis, natural history, personal responsibilities, identification of others at risk, social and financial effects, and initiation of ERT. Now, this is a figure that you need to know that when you have an acute primary infection, then which is a HIV syndrome, where the patients will present with fever, they recover from it at a long period of time. There is a latency when they're totally asymptomatic. Then they start getting smaller and minor symptoms, and finally they go to the stage of AIDS. Now, when we look at this, two to three weeks after the infection, test is maybe negative, the patient is asymptomatic, acute infection may take within two to three weeks, test becomes positive, fever, body pain, throat pain may be there, and most of the patients will completely recover. During the asymptomatic phases, patients are positive, there are no symptoms, and it lasts for eight to 10 years, and CD4 count is around 500. And during this patient, the time is when you get autoimmune diseases being present. We talked about autoimmune diseases when we were talking about how to suspect HIV infection. Then they have minor problems when they become cystic, which may last for three to four years. And CD4 count is between 500 to 200. When the CD4 drops to 200, they go into a stage of AIDS where they have major opportunistic infections, malignancies. And it may last for two to three years and patient may succumb to it. And how do we explain this concept to the patient who is coming to you? And most of our patients may not have not read biology. So there is no point in talking about immunity and CD4 cells. And usually what I tell them is there is a germ in your body which has affected. I don't even use the word virus because virus means they do not understand what the virus is. So I tell them there is a germ in the body. It affects a type of W white blood cells called the CD4 cells. Now to explain what is a white blood cell, I tell them, see, when you get injury at on pricks, you have pus being formed. Pus from your and you get blood. 
So that is the red blood cells are drained out. And over a period of time, pus forms, and that is the white blood cells. So these white blood cells are necessary for controlling the infection. And since they cannot control the, the CD4 cells are a part of white blood cells, and they are getting destroyed. And as the disease progresses, the patient cannot fight disease. To give the, an example for this is, I tell them three points that are there to say how diseases are there and patient cannot fight them. I tell them normal diseases will take longer time to recover. I give an example of fever or diarrhea. When a patient has got fever or diarrhea, it is usually in the asymptomatic phase, like any other normal person, it may last for one or two days. When it develops at a minor stage or the it advances between 200 to 500, the same fever, same diarrhea lasts for a week. And if they go into a stage of AIDS, patients go into developing the same problems for two, one or two months. So they get the idea of what is happening, how their body is facing, <coughs> cannot face infections. Then the next example that I give them is normal diseases present with abnormal presentations. And I give an example of tuberculosis. Because it's a common disease people know of. I tell them if anybody comes with fever, cough, and the fever and cough last for more than two weeks, the doctor will think of tuberculosis. If he has hemoplasis, a cough blood, you know that he has got tuberculosis. He'll make a, take a chest X-ray or he'll examine his sputum. And by a <coughs> very short time, the disease will be diagnosed and the treatment will be initiated so that your body does not get damaged. But if you have HIV positive, you may have tuberculosis somewhere else. You may get swelling in the bodies, which may turn out to be tuberculosis. You may have diarrhea, the intestine may be affected. So this way we give them examples so that they'll understand that sometimes it is difficult to diagnose infections when people become positive. Then we can also give them an example of how a simple skin infection, like a fungal infection. We tell them you get the itching over the groins or anywhere in the body. And people, and people, people know that simple infection. Uh, can I request everyone else to mute their interviews? And people know that this infection is taking place. And the same infection, which is there on the surface of the body, gets into your bloodstream and the treatment becomes <clears throat> worse. And after that, I tell them that nobody dies because of HIV infection. They die because they get infections from over, over and above that. And once they develop these infections, they can fight the infection and we have treatment for them. So I end this part of the counseling by giving them a positive feedback that they can and they will live with HIV infection. Now, when we talk about general management, then we go into what a person can do if I got HIV positive. This is what the patient will ask. All this is okay, now what should I do? And for this, I've divided it into nutrition, exercise, treatment of opportunistic infections, prophylaxis, empirical symptomatic, treatment of HIV infection, palliative care and care of the dying. Now, when we talk about nutritional support, remember they need to maintain ideal body weight. And one of the things that we talk to them is food hygiene. And how, what do you mean by food hygiene? That they should cook their food properly because the heat kills the bacteria and so they will be protected from gut infections. Similarly, eating <coughs> food which has, not been, which has been stored for a long time and which has been reheated is a problem. So we always ask them to heat food and eat and only cooked food stuffs will be taken. When they talk about cooked food stuffs, it's also important that they should think about water. Tell them that they should drink only uh, filter water or boiled water, not ordinary water. That prevents infection. Then we talk about calories. They require high, good nutrition, high protein diet, within, which will be give at least one gram of kg per day of high quality protein. And the example we to eat at least minimum of one egg per day. And many of the ERT centers, I don't know why the counselor said they don't eat any non-vegetarian, they are pure vegetarian. We need proteins. And so we must insist they should, even if they are vegetarian, should have high protein diet. 
adequate micronutrients are necessary because in 1987-88, the only medicine that we could offer these patients was to give micronutrients like beta carotene, B12, folic acid, pyridoxine, zinc, selenium, and magnesium, which is available in foods. And now when you say you eat any food you want, the next question is asked will be, how can I cook the fruit? You said only eat cooked food. So usually I, what I tell them is, wash the food, peel the skin, and eat. Banana we eat without peeling the, I'm washing the fruit, we peel the skin. So bananas if you have to eat, wash the fruit, peel the skin, and eat. Apples we just wash the uh, <coughs> uh, thing, and, but we eat without removing the skin of the banana, the apples. So I tell them to remove the skin of the apples and eat so that they'll be protected from infection as well as <clears throat> as well as all the toxins that are there, like wax that is used in coating of apples. Multivitamins and minerals, we would give them supplement. And it's important that they maintain oral hygiene by gargling their mouth immediately after they have their meals. Then when we talk about exercise, we recommend both isotonic and isometric exercises. And isometric exercises, is, for example, like playing games, running, jumping, swimming, whatever moves the body. And these are necessary to improve immune functions. They also need to do isometric exercises. That is, they contract, like going to the gym at least three or four times a week, doing push-ups, pull-ups at home, because it is helpful in maintaining uh, the weight of the patients. So both these type of exercises are necessary for HIV-infected patients. Now, when we talk about protection, remember, there is self-protection and protection of others from getting infection. Now, when we talk about self-protection, we talk about vaccination. This is a very important thing that we never bother about when we deal with HIV patients, but we need to think of them. They are <clears throat> more prone to get infected, so we need to talk about vaccination. And we should talk about the addiction, especially to tobacco. 100% no tobacco, 100% no alcohol for HIV positive patients. And we must make all our efforts to do this because both tobacco and alcohol can interact with antiretroviral medications and worsen their conditions. So we need to talk to the patients about undergoing de education, even if they have HIV. Then we talk about protecting others, that is in relation to safe sex practices and safe injection practices. Now, when we talk about immunization of adults, we talk about hepatitis B immunization, pneumococcal vaccination, influenza vaccination, and now we talk about COVID vaccination. The beginning of the epidemic of COVID fever is to recommend patients to take vaccination with COVID vaccines, but now guidelines very clearly mention that we need HIV positive patients need to take COVID vaccination. Similarly, human papilloma virus vaccination has to be done. Zoster vaccine is something that has come about recently. It's totally it's still difficult to get in India, but abroad, but that is also recommended for people who have not had herpes zoster in the past. So these are the immunizations that will protect the HIV positive patient from other infections. Now, when we talk about medical management, we talk about ERT management, treat of opportunistic infections, empirical treatment, symptomatic treatment, and palliative care. Though the patient receives medicine from someone else, as a primary physician, we need to tell them what is happening, what ART will be given, what the opportunistic infections, how are they treated, and all this treatment has to be talk talked about, and it is also a part of our counseling when you talk about this uh, parts. We need to treat the identify opportunistic infections. No difference in treatment between HIV positive patients and negative patients for all the infections that they have. And what, as family medical practitioners, that we can pick up and treat our oral candida, herpes zoster, refer and screen for tuberculosis. Other infections may be difficult to treat in family practice, and they need to be referred to entire races. We also have to talk about four time oxygen prophylaxis for opportunistic infections, and we should be capable of treating symptomatic treatment for patients who have problems. When we talk about ERT, as soon as diagnosis is made, we need to start ERT. 
second thing that you have to emphasize is art is a lifelong commitment it is not one day two days it's a lifelong commitment therefore when you have initiation on the first day itself it is becoming more difficult to counsel patients for a lifelong commitment with the previous day at least we knew that this person may be committed may take but here the onus is for the counselors to talk about lifelong commitment from day one of diagnosis and we should also emphasize they should take all medications that are prescribed and the best response is the first ert medication which they take if they are if they default on that first line of medications that they start they will have much more difficulty in treating these patients so this has to be emphasized when we are counseling the patient before starting patient on ert and there's a whole lot of drugs that are used i'm not going into all this and drugs that are there i just put it up in the slide so that you will know what today has been made very simple drug it becomes a three drug regimen which is made into a single pill and this is what the government of india management as well as anywhere in the world will talk about we give them tenofovir but now lambudit and dulatagavir uh, these are three major drugs that we talk about in addition we also use <coughs> imprecitable and sometimes efavirenz are being used in treatment so treatment has been simplified dramatically in this you can just give one tablet which this patient has to swallow now when we talk about this the dosages are there tenofovir are two types are there alfalomide and uh, ddf uh, tdf tdf is much more cheaper it's available in maco taf is costlier but it is still available in the market that can be there you have imicitabine dolotagavir which is 50 mg then you have tenofovir disposable fumarate 300 mg lambudi and it can be used with efavirenz or dolotagavir then we have patients who have got renal failure we have a chance of using abacavir which is least toxic with dolotagavir or imicitabine so we have only few drugs and we have the dosages are there and there are fixed combinations and they are all for helping people to take medication easily now before starting the treatment it is mandatory that they should have a viral load and previously we used to do a cd4 count but cd4 count is an optional requirement but viral load is mandatory in addition to that we need to screen for associated diseases serology for hepatitis b hepatitis c syphilis tuberculosis has to be ruled out either by a chest x ray or an abdominal ultrasound complete blood counts are necessary to see for monitoring therapy serum creatinine urine routine micro lipid <coughs> function test and sometimes i'm sorry liver function tests and lipids are used as a optimal test for checking these patients and counseling on ert what we need to talk about is regular medication has to be taken not to miss a single dose and side effects have to be expected now when we talk about side effects in hiv medication remember there are two types of side effects that these patients are likely to experience one is a regular side effect of the drug like for example if you take paracetamol you can get gastritis okay so that type of side effects can occur when you give these patients ert medication the second thing that happens which are patients are difficult for patients to understand is once you start giving ert medication patients immunity improves and as the immunity improves patient will may present with hidden infections becoming manifest which is known as irs in the, in the technical terms so you tell them you may be having for some diseases you must have a good immunity only then the disease can manifest so when we start your ert if you have a disease which is there hidden in the body it can come out so the first six months are crucial because ert can induce infections to come out so often we see patients develop a tuberculosis and sometimes it is cytomegalovirus retinitis can occur which is can be life threatening uh, very threatening for the patient not life threatening very threatening for the patient so we need to train them that they become sick after taking the drugs if they are taken otherwise patients will lose 
Let's say after, before taking GLT, I was quite all right. After taking GLT, I have developed all these problems, so I'm going to discontinue. So if they know that this is an anticipated side effect that patients will have, they'll be more particular that they will not <coughs> do that. Then second thing that is there is they should come for regular checkup and lab tests, which we'll talk about a little later. At present, treatment is lifelong. And I always tell them, you take these tablets regularly for six months, your blood is free of the virus. You continue the same treatment for the next two months, I'm mean, sorry, two years, the virus will disappear from lymph nodes. Usually, remember, the word lymph node is difficult for a person to understand. So I tell them the easiest thing is to use the term toxin. When you say toxin, most of the people will understand what it is. And we say it's, it's, it's a lipoid tissue. So you tell them you take for two years, it will disappear. And you tell them on every and in the intestine, the virus will last for at least 25 years. Therefore, in 2021, treatment is lifelong. So you must insist when counseling that these are the things that you would do for the patient. And this is a scientific basis we had, which we talk about. We have three different tools of HIV in the body. One is the, which is produced, which has a, uh, this thing, productively infected uh, CD lymphocytes are there. And usually they have a half-life of one day. So uh, early ERT medication will kill this food. The second thing one is what you have long lived population, which may be present in the in the body, which lasts for a long period of time, which can be de destroyed. And the third one is latently infected, which lasts for a long period of time. Maybe now, when you talk about adherence, and there, this is where we have to use little. A little ingenuity to explain to them what happens when adherence is lost. And usually we stress on daily medication, explain the effect of missing a single dose on viral load. And usually I give this example. The body has billions of viruses in the body a day, and every day with ART medication, 10% of the virus will get destroyed. So I give an example. If you have 100 viruses in the body, you take uh, medicine on the first day, 90 percent of viruses will be remaining. And on the second day, it will come to, if you have taken the medicine, it will come to 80. Third day, it will come to 70, giving a <coughs> much identical identity to these numbers. And if you have skipped from 90, it becomes 180. You skip for one more day, it becomes 900. It is something that goes like geometric progression. And if the CD4, I'm sorry, your virus is 900 and you take the tablet, Instead of coming to 70, it's come to 810. So this sort of example sort of makes people understand what we mean by the skipping a drug and the effect of that drug on the virus. And I tell them, if you skip the drug, nothing will happen to your body. But inside your body, this is what is going to happen. So instead of getting better and better, you will become worse for a period of time. And most of the patients understand this concept of the viral load decreasing. Then as general practitioners, we need to monitor the body weight. Every reset, you monitor the body weight. You talk about adherence. Even if it comes with cough and cold, ask the patient about his adherence to drugs. It's the important thing that we need to talk about. Then you talk about, every visit, you talk about clinical monitoring. Then you talk about screen for TB, CD4 cell counts, are done every six months according to NACO and viral loads at the end of six months and at the 12 months. And if they are completely suppressed, you repeat it once a year. So the cost of treatment for the patient also comes down over a period of time. Now, common side effects that you saw you see in uh, TDF is renal function may be affected, decrease in bone mineral density may be there, and hepatomegaly is there, patients may develop lactic acidosis. Have tenofovir alfonamide, they have dyslipidemias and they get body get, <coughs> weight gain. And doltagavir also produces weight gain. So when you give TAF with doltagavir, patients will put on a weight and then they'll come and tell you, 
ಎಷ್ಟು ವರ್ಷ ನನ್ನ ಫ್ರೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಇದೆ ಸರ್ ಇವಾಗ ನೋಡಿ ಎಷ್ಟು ತಪ್ಪಿಗೆ ಆಗ್ಬಿಟ್ರಿ ನಿಮ್ಮ ಮಾತೆ ತಗೊಂಡು ಈ ಡಸನ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಇಫೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೈಡ್ ಎಫೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೆಡಿಕೇಶನ್ he thinks it is because his hiv has come down that's why he is improving so so it is one of those things that will happen and remember with increase in body weight the patients will develop all the problems and complications that go with obesity then we have <coughs> body weight hypersensitivity reactions are there mental changes can occur with efavirenz and no major side effects are seen with uh, lamivudin or mtcitrabine abacavir pill may produce hypersensitivity reactions now when we talk about common questions that people ask are where did i get it how long is the the disease with me what will be answered if somebody asks these questions what answer will you give i usually tell them some blood I, no, pardon yeah carry on no some Is blood that... transfusion or uh, any treatment he has taken or exposure exposure okay i remember one thing when you ask where you got it when i got it my answer is i do not know okay see everybody tries to justify that they have been very good people that they have not committed any Well, you know, sexual offense, or let me put it that way. So they always will blame some injection given by a doctor, some injection that has been there, or some blood transfusion, or some accident. Okay, I tell them it does not matter how you got it. Now you have this look after it, and even if you know how you got it, you cannot do anything. You cannot go and fight with the doctor who has uh, given that infection to you, or the lab which has given you blood transfusion. so i tell them don't worry about how you got it and from where you got it similarly how long the disease is with me we cannot predict now person suppose the person has received one blood transfusion he will progress to aids within two months i'm sorry two years a person who has got a sexually transmitted disease and who has got a slow progressor may not manifestation of hiv aids even after 20 to 30 years after getting the infection so we cannot answer this question and you tell them this cannot be answered for the patients similarly okay should i tell my wife what is it then yes see it is easy to say yes i just tell, tell your wife but in practice there are three types of things that you have one thing is if the relationship between the husband and wife is good the person will say i'll tell my wife but give me time for two or three months i'll tell her and then i'll bring her this occurs in about 8 to 10% of the patient and the next type of scenario that you have is patient will not tell his wife but after a period of time they come and tell she am becoming very sick you tell my wife that i have got this disease if you say she believe and you also tell her you got it through blood transfusion okay that is the second type of person you get third is no person will say don't worry about my weight treat me and go okay so though it is ethically and legally not right but we are sometimes forced to do that when we deal with patients okay and this is another thing that i'll say so, uh, we bring the patient and the wife to the hospital you check the hiv status without telling her and remember if that happens and if the wife comes to know her hiv status was tested both the doctor as well as the hospital will be prosecuted and it will become criminal negligence of uh, patients so you must be very careful when you are dealing with my other the families that is the infected partners i mean i have affected partners of the infected patients can i marry what would you say maybe okay 
Of course, you can marry. I'll come to that a little later when we talk about it. Okay. Can I have normal children? Yes. Wait, maybe a positive lady comes and says, can I have normal children? What answer would you give? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. May because we not. talk about it when we are talking about prevention. Then, can I play with my children? Yes. yes you can play is. with your children because you should, unless there is a sexual contact, this will not be transmitted. Unless you have blood spilling, you will not have this. Should I change my job? No, not required. Not, not required. I think it Should depends. Uh, please go ahead. Some, someone had a comment that it depends. No, uh, uh, could, could. Yeah, I, I was saying about the job. It depends what kind of job they are doing uh, to say whether they have to change it or not. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what about insurance, ma'am? They have to change the insurance. I think they have to update it. Okay. Will the employer remove me from my job? Can he be dismissed because it's HIV positive? Is that clerk in our office? They're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. Okay. So protecting me against all this, we had the HIV law which was passed in 2017. And it is one of the most comprehensive laws that are there on paper, never implemented. So according to this, you cannot dismiss a person and you cannot ask a person to change the job unless he's a threat to other people. Okay, there is a whole lot of uh, the rulings for the Supreme Court, which says as long as a person is a threat to others, he can be removed from the job. If he's not a threat to the others, he will have to be continued in the job forever. Two examples I'll give you. One is a story of a, uh, of a sailor who was in the submarine. He developed HIV infection, and because he developed pulmonary tuberculosis actually, and when he developed pulmonary tuberculosis, the ship, the submarine had to come to surface so that he could get treatment outside in the, on the land. And after that, maybe refused to allow him to go to work on the submarine. He challenged this in the government and he was found to be HIV positive. But he said, I've been cured of tuberculosis, why should I go to work in the submarine? And the Supreme Court was very clear saying, if something happens to you, because you are HIV positive, this was in 1990s, treatment is not possible in the submarine and if you may spread if you have again threats of HIV, I'm sorry, tuberculosis, you may spread in the community. Therefore, you will not go. As compared to this type of case, there was another case where a sweeper was removed from a corporation saying is HIV positive. The Supreme Court said you have to reinstate and pay the uh, back to wages of this person because he is not a threat to the society. He is as long as he is able to do his job properly. So, because of all this, now we have a comprehensive law. And till today, some of the articles you might have seen in paper, it has never been implemented. Insurance is also supposed to be. Yeah, uh, Similarly, can I request everyone to uh, mute their phones? So, and insurance is also supposed to be provided for these patients, but unfortunately, Many insurance companies do not provide for this. Now, when you come to here, a new case, case is Mr. K is on ART medication, he's married and practices safe sex with his wife. He discovers. Yeah. Uh, sir, just in terms of time, because it is about 3.55, uh, should we take a few audience questions? I'm coming to this. This is an audience question. Okay, so, sure, sure. Please go ahead, sir. He is married, practice safe sex with his wife. He discovers that the condom has broken during sex. The couple contacts him. What will you do? This is an emergency, no? Person is on IRT medication. He is having, uh, he is married. Give post, now, post exposure prophylaxis to his post wife. If the if the partner is HIV, if the partner is normal, then we need to administer post exposure prophylaxis. Okay, what will you give, sir? Uh, probably the triple drug regimen for a month. Okay, 
Anybody else? Wait for the uh, wait for the period and do the test for the wife. Uh huh. Okay, you do the test for the wife. Okay, good. Now, what you do first thing that you do is question that we have to answer is what are the chances of developing HIV after a single unprotected sexual act? I think it's Anybody? pretty high. Pretty high. Pretty high. One single sexual act is pretty high, is it? Can you put a percentage, ma'am? Is it 10%, 20%, 50%? It's quite uh, rare. I think I, it's I one in 800. 40%. Pardon? 40%. Okay. Sir, you were saying something else? Yeah, I think it's quite rare. It's one in uh, probably 300, 400 or something like that. I'm not okay. sure, but it's quite okay. rare. Right. Sir, it will be okay. 0 0.3 percentage. No. 0 0.3 percent. Okay, fine. So there is a whole lot. We'll come to that later. And what are the chances that Mr. K can transmit the infection to his wife? He's on the air. Very low chances. Very low chances. Okay. We'll go to the next slide and see that. Remember, like you said, in vaginal, insert vaginal sex, the chance of getting infected is 0.4%. It's a very, very low probability. So if somebody by the accident breaks her, like, you can assure them that chances of them getting infected will be very, very low. Okay, that's the first point that you would talk about. Second thing that you would do is to know the viral load of the Mr. K. And usually, viral load becomes undetectable, transmission becomes zero. So if the person has got <coughs> this thing, <coughs> first, in the first six months, it takes for the virus to become undetectable in blood. And after the next six months, the chances of transmitting HIV to another person becomes zero. That is why we had this on the, the slogan, U equals U. <coughs> Undetectable is equal to untransmissible. And that is why today we talk about treating HIV infections to prevent the spread of HIV infection. We are not talking about condoms or other ABCs of prevention. We are talking about take drugs, suppress your viral load so that you do not <coughs> spread the infection to others. So these are two things that you would do. And usually we give Tenofovir with lamivudin or emisectrovir, which is easily available, one tablet a day, and usually give it for 28 days. And if you have some doubts, you can, patients can be given on dolotagavir as a third drug, alternate third drugs can be dornavir, lapnavir. And remember, once you start giving this, you give them for 28 days. Why 28 days? Because that is what we have done in animal experimentation. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when you talk about testing, you test the patient immediately. Because if the patient is already HIV positive, immediately, that means this act of sex has not the cause for the person to become positive. Then you check after three weeks, then you walk with, check again after six weeks, 12 weeks, and at the end of six months for that. We do not use ephemerans for post exposure prophylaxis because it can produce central nervous system side effects. So either you give, if you give two drugs is more than enough, if you want, you can give a third drug and that third drug would be dolotagavir because it's easily available and cheaper now. And alternate third drug that you can give is <coughs> darnavir, lopinavir, or altagavir can be given. Ephemerans never have been, can not be given. This is usually easily available, but now we cannot use it for post-exposure prophylaxis after sex. Then we have another case. Mr. K is positive on ART, comes with his wife, Mrs. R to you, with a request that they have to decided to have a child by natural means. How can you help them? Anybody would like to answer this question? They can go ahead and uh, 
try to conceal because okay. he is on ART and the transmission would be less. Okay. Can you give something more for the wife to be protected? Yeah, we, uh, maybe we can give her a prophylaxis. I mean, uh, even like pregnant women also given uh, anti uh, 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 anti HIV sorry. drugs. So, uh, this is the concept. Okay, this is the concept that we talk about pre exposure prophylaxis. So, even before the person has sexual contact, we can give prophylaxis to prevent that person from getting infected. I am going to tell you now how I do it in practice. Now, if couples want to conceive a child naturally, what I tell them is check. I presume that husband is positive, wife is negative. This is the usual scenario that you get. Check the husband's viral load and see that viral load is zero. Check the HIV status of the wife. Okay. Then check the wife's renal functions and hemoglobin levels because. Drugs that we use can produce toxicity for this. Yes. The third thing that I do for these patients is teach them to recognize signs of ovulation. Luckily, working in St. John's Medical College, we have a fertility department which practices natural family planning. So they teach them all this temperature matters, <coughs> the cervical mucus membrane or mucus method, and things like that. I tell them to do exactly opposite for what they do, teach them in natural family time. I tell them that they should have sex because that is the time when they are ovulating. And once they have learned this method of recognizing ovulation in their body, I ask them to maintain a chart for the next three months so that I'm convinced that this person knows how to check her ovulation. And then I prescribe pre-exposure prophylaxis. Okay, start the drug on the first day of ovulation. 24 hours later, the husband and wife have unprotected sex for at least for five days. And if the patient becomes pregnant, because within, and this is given for, prophylaxis is given for at least 28 days. So if the patient becomes pregnant, she misses her periods and she can test her pregnancy and confirm that she's pregnant. And once she knows that she's pregnant, she stops all medications. And if the patient is not pregnant and continue prophylaxis for 28 days and repeat the cycle for the next ovulation starts. And if the patient does not become pregnant after six or eight cycles, I usually refer them to infertility clinic. Now, when we talk about regimens, the standard regimen is to give tenofovir emisetribate once a day for 28 days. The other one is known as two, two plus one regimen. That is, before sex, they have two doses, that is tenofovir and emisetribit, 24 hours before sex. Then before two hours before sex, you again repeat the dose of tenofovir and emisetribit. 24 hours after the last dose, as, uh, you give a single dose. 48 hours after the first two doses, you give the, uh, the third dose. And if more sex acts take place in the following day, a single dose can be continued as long as sexual risk continues. And usually, it is taken for two days after the last sex act. So this is the different regimen. I'm not very familiar with a uh, two, two uh, plus one regimen. I always follow the standard regimen for dealing with it. And most of my patients will become pregnant within three cycles. And WHO recommends many other things that you have done. The latest one is Dabavirin vaginal rings that can be used for prevention of infection. And usually you test before the initiation of therapy. One month after the PRP use can, uh, is used, you recheck to see whether they have become positive. And the drugs are very safe during pregnancy or in their breastfeeding the patients. Now we have a pandemic that is COVID. And COVID and HIV have a lot of problems. HIV positive patients have 24% higher risk of infection, <laughs> opportunistic infection, 78% of higher risk of death. There was no difference in clinical presentation, ICU admissions, or mechanical ventilations. And factors that have, may have a worse prognosis as presence of multiple morbidity in older age group, which is also similar for patients who have just only pain COVID. And 
whereas studies have shown there may be poor response to vaccination. COVID on, uh, also had an effect on HIV medications. The effect of anti-HIV uh, drugs did not prevent patients from getting COVID <coughs> infection and disruption of ERT treatment because of lockdown. And that has been a major reason the patients are HIV positive patients have suffered. And usually it's a six month disruption in the HIV transmission caused more than 50,000 extra deaths from Sub-Saharan Africa. And how we came over that is the ERT center started dispensing patients who are on regular medications and virus appreciated. They started dispensing the three months medications at a time. Not only that, in some ERT centers, they sent courier the medicines so that the patients would have <coughs> would have ERT medication throughout. So what this HIV and COVID has done is it has strengthened our ERT services and the patient interaction that is going on with that. Then we talk about achievements of ERT is it's effective uh, um, pre-exposure prophylactic is effective. Early detection is possible. Undetectable viral growth reduces the spread of HIV. Longer lives for those who live with the HIV infection. The future developments that have occurred in this is we have new therapeutic classes. We have got new lipocyte reverse transcriptor location inhibitors, maturation inhibitors, drugs that wire in the viral proteins. And the other important thing that as family physicians that you have to notice, simplification of regimens. We have injectables, we have two drug regimens. And we also have point of care tests which can be done in the out in the in the clinic as well as patients themselves can happen. We talk about vaccines and lastly we always hope that we'll have a cure for this disease. Now one of the things that we talk about in telepathy is carboxylurin and repilivirin. These are two drugs that are used. You the first month you give them oral carbotagavir and replevarate. And after that, second month you give them injection, initiate with the <clears throat> injectable drug. And if 30 months onwards, you give them the replevarate once a month for life. So this obviously will reduce the patients and help the patients to be there. And usually they have minor symptoms, like skin reactions, hepatotoxicity, and they may have depression, will be there. Neutralizing antibodies are directly bind to a virus and prevent their entry into the cell. And they can increase the rate of elimination, ensure the killing of virus. Antibodies binding to the viral fragments can form a complex that will subsequently lead to development of immunity against future viral infections. And treatment should include a combination of multiple antibodies, a combination of drugs and antibodies for that. Now, when we talk about vaccines, today we do not have any vaccines which are effective. There are two types of vaccines that we talk about. One is a preventive vaccine, that is to prevent the HIV infection from spreading to others. Another is therapeutic vaccine, which can immune, <coughs> change the immunity so that they can stimulate the immune system and prepare the body to get control of the HIV infection for prolonged periods of time. So these are two types of vaccines which are under development. As of today, we do not have an effective vaccine that can be administered. Newer methods are there. Vaginal ring, I've already talked about now. Point of care tests are there. We have HIV cell testing kits, and we have point of care wild load testing kits, which make the treatment and follow-up of the patients much more easier. And cure for HIV is in development. And drugs that can inhibit replicating or finding the specific RNA sequences of the viruses. Right? We can activate the dormant viruses by drugs. We can do immunotherapy. We can use gene editing. Recently, you might have seen that there are patients who have survived. There are two patients who have survived because of bone marrow transplantation from there. And there is another report which talks about a long-term prognostic <coughs> allied controller who does not have HIV infection. So there's always a hope that one day we will have that. And if we, all of us, combine together and do our best by 2030, we may be able to bring down HIV infections, especially the new infections to less than 100,000 all over the world. And with this, I shall stop. Any questions, I'm ready to take. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. G.D. Ravindran. You really uh, covered the entire uh, field of uh, what anyone 
uh, today should know about HIV. It's really been a 2D force. Uh, and your own career, having spanned all the different phases of the HIV epidemic, pandemic, uh, really to listen to you firsthand has been a wonderful experience. Um, I want to open the floor for anyone to ask any questions. My only request would be, if you can ask a question in the context of a patient you saw, then I think the discussion is going to be richer. Um, uh, the floor is open. A anyone with a question may ask. Sir. Uh, uh, and, and if you could just uh, introduce yourself when you ask the question, that will uh, make it even more engaging. Thank you. Okay. Sir, I'm Dr. Savita from uh, Belgam district, Nipani. Just want to know how to know about the resistance to the drug. See, as family practitioners, we cannot do resistance. It has to be done by an expert. Okay, you have to send a viral load. You have to do the resistant test for the virals. And once you get the resisting uh, <coughs> pattern, only then you will be able to <coughs> manage the HIV uh, uh, drug addiction. Since it's a complicated subject, I did not touch about drug resistance or biological failure in this thing. I totally talked about counseling and how to make people sensitive to the drugs and to take treatment. Because that's the whole chapter by itself and it's well, it's not fair that you discuss for 15 or five minutes on this topic. <clears throat> yeah, no, th thank you, th thank Dr. You, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, I think this question is timely. We won't discuss it today because there is rising burden of drug resistance and um, um, we can follow this up in a later conversation or something like that. Um, Thank you. Uh, other questions, please. So I don't have a question, but I have a comment. As usual, Dr. Ravindran's talk was excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, RK, if I'm allowed to, I'm Dr. Sapna here. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, sir, at some point of time in between, I think uh, the role of Cotrimox is also for methazoxine. No? It, is it right from day one of uh, diagnosis? And uh, there was a time where we had some difficulty in getting this drug um, you know, in the market. Was there any other drug which was used at that time or do you just keep it aside in case there is a problem? No. See, co-trimoxazole prophylaxis, there are certain guidelines which have been given to start co-trimoxazole prophylaxis. Okay, those guidelines have to be followed. Now, the question is, should we follow those guidelines? Because once you start ART as early as possible, chances of them getting opportunistic infection decreases dramatically. And there is, in my experience, the patients who have been started on ART, you will very rarely find patients coming with PCP pneumonia in those patients, or for that matter, any other pneumonia. So it becomes uh, redundant to give these people on prophylaxis. Okay, so if the person said septran is not available, we can always give them other drugs, like Dapton can be used, Ignamycin can be used, which is easily available and can be given to these patients. Does it answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Swapna. I think that was a very, very good uh, Sir, good year. afternoon. We are calling to, we are uh, speaking from Crestwell Hospital, sir. I'm Eva. Mr. Eva from Infection Control. Go ahead, Eva. Yes, sir. I just wanted to know. So, in other hospitals, some hospitals, they follow up patients give birth. We are not allowing to feed the baby. Is that any discussion that we have? <laughs> no, no, I did not follow. If the child is born, they don't allow the mother to touch, uh, touch the child. Why? No, no. Feed the baby. Feeding. Why? Why? No, is it any chances of getting transmission of this? See, you, you can get, there is 14% chance of infecting the uh, breast milk. Okay. okay. But yeah. if the mother is on ERT, the chances of being transmitted of the breast milk becomes very, very low. Number one. Number two is if the child uh, mother has received anti uh, this thing, uh, prophylaxis for pregnancy during pregnancy, dietobudine and all that. The child would have got uh, prophylaxis for at least fourteen days. I mean, uh, 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 weeks. So the chance of child getting infected by breast milk is 
very very low and should be encouraged one more question i have sir small announcement our employees uh, other uh, other employees other than the person asking the question and dr ravindran uh, please uh, everyone else kindly mute your uh, phones or uh, computers thank you go ahead eva yes sir if uh, any of the our employees get needle stick injury with hiv positive patient and if you are providing this uh, whatever the post prophylaxis is there within 6 hours or within a 2 hours like that and still is it any, uh, needed for any Um, viral load yes sir viral load assay sir what for? no no let me see if the person has got a needle stick injury he okay. has to have hiv elisa test okay, okay then you start a pre exposure program. i mean you give them the tenofovir imipetrin tablets whatever prophylaxis you are following you follow the this thing then okay. as per the protocol you test the patient okay, okay. Uh, so there's no need to do viral load you have to do elisa on this patients Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Dr. Ravinder. You uh, covered multiple. There was one fantastic slide you had, which uh, had the common questions a doctor gets asked by a patient or the family, uh, whether related to marriage or children or how long will I live. Um, I, I thought uh, in the remaining ten minutes. um uh, there were a couple of uh, scenarios which commonly come up in my practice and i i thought uh, perhaps i could ask you and you could share uh, the conversation you have with patients uh, so one um, question is sometimes um, patients are brought by say a well wisher and the patient or the patient himself comes but the patient also tells you that they are taking some uh, medications like ayurvedic medications or homeopathic medications and they tell you that they are concerned about taking anti retroviral therapy because of its um, perceived toxicity how do you counsel them what do you what do you tell them first and foremost i tell them is i have no knowledge about medicines that you are taking so i cannot make a judgment on those medicines okay then the second thing that i say if that medicine which you are taking ayurveda was effective it would have already been in allopathic medicine and i always give them some example like digoxin which has been used now it is a plant based product and when i found that it was effective it was there and some of this especially from tamil nadu fellows they know about uh, vinca in tamil nadu they call that uh, like aadu thoda ele they use it for cough okay so i tell them that is there and the same medicine that has been used for treatment of cancer so if it is there we would have applied it but we know what we are having we know the side effects will be there but if you and the present side effects are so low that you will not <coughs> suffer from major illness it's always better to take what is known than taking something which is unknown because in ayurveda hundred thousands of years ago nobody described hiv aids so how will you find a cure in hiv aids because this was much more a problem in good old days when in madras when we did not have any <clears throat> treatment we had a practitioner and i mean professor of pulmonary medicine called devasagayam who also used to practice ayurveda he used to tell the patients soak your legs for one hour in ice water so that the virus will move off then he used to tell them to take a, a, this saying you know various uh, churnams to take and all that and most of the people you know because they have nothing else to do at least this you know you can put your leg in the water and meditate how good or how bad you have been in life that makes them give little this thing but most of the patients died the same thing we had another person in in uh, in uh, kerala who is to who called hamid who is to prescribe medicines and you would have loads of people going to anaklum to eat his medicine by his medicines and use them okay and he had, he was very smart he used to tell the patients you go only to this hospital in bombay to check your viral load and i mean those days we didn't talk about viral load we talked about cd4 counts and hiv elisa becoming negative and all these people once the elt came nobody talks about these things once we have an effective this thing you do not have to think of all this and we tell them we do not know anything about ayurveda it was good it would have been in the program it is not there even government of india does not recommend ayurvedic products for treatment of hiv if you want that is your
Does it answer your question? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so and and how do people uh, respond when when you say that, when when how is no, the engagement? It depends on what they believe in. No, it depends mm -hmm. on their beliefs. Okay, if there are some people who will never believe any allopathic medicine. And those people will just shrug it off like we touch our color. I know whether they shrug allopathy and go. But many people mm -hmm. get con uh, convinced and start taking GRT medications. Yeah, I think in the um, I think one of the things I find uh, useful to ask is many people have a sense of nocebo when they say they, their uh, you know perception of toxicity. So sometimes asking you know what are you concerned about, and then sometimes they'll tell you uh, things like oh I think this is going to cause headaches in me or I'm going to lose weight because of this or something like that. So addressing addressing that uh, is quite useful. But but thank you very much. Um, I have one more question, and then uh, perhaps if someone else has a question, that will be great. How do you, um, now say a zero discordant couple, couple comes to you, and you covered this, you actually covered this um, very comprehensively. Um, but say they want to have children the natural way. Let us say the husband is positive, the wife is negative, HIV positive and HIV negative, and say the viral load is undetectable in the husband. With you mentioned U is equal to U, that is undetectable is equal to untransmittable. With how much confidence and in what manner do you counsel the couple? See, whatever you talk about is also the people want 100% protection. They will not say there's 0.1% chance. So I'll tell them this will be the it's 0.001%, you will not get infected. But if you want to be 100% sure, take the APRD. Otherwise, don't bother. Okay, there are two or three couples who have done that also, who refuse to take and medication. They said, okay, we'll take that chance. So it's how they perceive is what we should be there. And that does not come with one contact. No? It takes at least three, four visits and some three, four months before they get that type of confidence to talk to you about these issues. Um, thank you, Dr. Ravinder. Um, anyone else with a question? Excuse Otherwise, me, I have one last question. Excuse me, sir. Uh, I would like Please to ask a question. Uh, I'm Dr. Matthews, uh, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I wanted to ask you two concerns of uh, my patients who had. Uh, um, one, of, one of the guys is a 21-year-old male who, who, who is infected from childhood, and he has been on sedalinin. Recently, he has been transferred to Trolutic Davil. And after that, he is complaining of hair loss. And uh, initially, when I uh, saw him after that, uh, uh, we are taking care of that children. And uh, when he came, um, he had patchy hair loss. And later, we diagnosed it as um, uh, alopecia areata. And now he's on steroid injections um, for six cycles now. Uh, he's, uh, and some of our children who has been who had been changed into dolutic travel i'm seeing hair loss is it uh, because they are very young it is a concern for them and is it somehow related with the drug i i, I was looking at the uh, literature and i couldn't find uh, very much into that are, are you seeing so no hair loss is not something that we see in children in patients because nobody has complained of hair loss remember Alopecia areata is an autoimmune sort of phenomenon. So it may be totally not linked to the drug. It may be something which has happened to him as part of regular uh, life cycle, life disease that this person is acquiring. As far as I know, nobody has complained to me about Neurotagavir hair loss. So I wouldn't consider that as a much problem. And this usually happens that when you change something which they are used to, there's always some amount of this type of thing. They may be, have been losing hair before that also. Now they'll make that as a major problem. Okay, uh, okay sir. I, I, I was uh, asking about, uh, because they are young, they have been a long term on these medications. Whatever extra medications, they they don't usually warm up to that, these children. Um, and it's always and, there. Yeah. And one more doubt I had, uh, sir. It was a call from North India, and uh, one guy, um, one of the relatives called me because 40-year-old guy recently diagnosed with HIV, maybe six months. 
he was on treatment for uh, TB as well as HIV. And now his uh, CD4 count is um, uh, no, uh, 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 CD4 count is 120, that range. And he developed PML. Um, and uh, now he has um, lost the functions of his uh, uh, limbs as well as his. Um, um, and the relative's concern was that whether he would improve if um, his uh, CD4 counts improved. They had been sent, he, has, he had been sent home. And uh, since it was a new knowledge and stigma is still there, he is almost shunned from family. Only one relative is taking, uh, taking care of them, him. And uh, what can I um, say to them regarding the progress? To tell them that to take ART medications as his immunity improves, he will recover some functions, but it will not be 100% recovery of functions. Always give that hope to them. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Matthew, and thank you, Dr. Ravindra. We've come to the end of the session. I'm just scanning the questions that have been asked on the chat box. Um, I think most Can questions have been asked, uh, answered. There was one question by Dr. Swapna. Uh, perhaps you could just take a, a, a few seconds to answer that. Does ELISA and RAT? Um, I'm assuming rapid uh, uh, testing have similar sensitivity and specificity. And, right for and, what? Is it for COVID? Uh, I think no, it is. Uh, Dr. Swapna, would you like to answer the question and then? No, no, I, I understood what she She must have missed to, it. The rapid, uh, I mean, sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> the part that we get. Is that uh, also in ELISA, the card test that we get normally, which gives yeah. results in a few minutes? Yeah. Is that also ELISA based? It's also uh, there's like different uh, capture uh, technique that is used. It is not ELISA based as such. It looks at antibodies and detection that takes place. Unless it is 98% sensitive and specific, it will not be available. So doing a card test is still reliable, but it has to be confirmed with a classical ELISA. Okay, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to know because most of the time as pre-op investigations, we just ask for a card test. So is it equally reliable is what I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now I invite our president, Dr. Swapna Bhaskar, to uh, propose the vote of thanks. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think Dr. Manju was just uh, wanting to ask something. If we can give her a minute too, Dr. Manju, please. Sure. Hello. Yeah, good evening, sir. Go ahead, Dr. Manju. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It was a very uh, informative session. I have a doubt. Uh, a pregnant lady for her regular ANC. I've lost you. Oh, right. Uh, Dr. Manju, um, I don't think any of us is able to hear you. Um, Dr. Swapna, since it is 4.30, perhaps we can go ahead with the vote of thanks. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much. I think my video has given me some trouble. I'm not sure if I'm visible. Uh, but uh, I think from uh, all of us in AFPA Karnataka, and all the listeners uh, who have attended this, uh, a big thank you to Dr. Ravindran. I think this has been one of the most informative, practical uh, uh, session which we've had uh, since a long time. And, you know, a lot of positive notes, a lot of uh, fresh information, which uh, we all thought we knew, but uh, came out as, you know, a lot of insights to us. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And I think um, it was so practically put out that uh, each of us could really relate it to our practice. Um, that's what I would like to say. And thank you so much. Uh, thanks to RK and Soumya also for uh, getting the session uh, done on time and uh, with a very short notice. I think we've hardly decided a week back that we wanted the session and everything just turned out so well. And also thanks to all the attendees who have been so patiently listening. I, I don't think anybody would have felt like leaving anywhere in between. So we, we had almost the full set of entertainment still the vote of thanks, I guess. So thank you, Dr. Ravindran, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Bye-bye. The session. Thank you. Bye.
<coughs> Thank you, Dr. Ravindra, for a wonderful session. So your experience speaks volumes of your knowledge. Thank you so much from our end as well. Many of my staff members, nurses also attended. They thoroughly enjoyed the program. I'll share some of the pictures. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Done. Huh? 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 Soumya, tomorrow morning the students will come in Matira. Huh?